everyone, and welcome. My name is Lori. I'm here with Dan Hughes, who is going to be talking about stepping back in time with vintage-inspired effects using Nick Analog FX3. So we're very excited to have you here with us today. Dan has been a longtime user of the Nick software. In fact, he, or the Nick collection, he worked for Nick software many, many years ago in the education department, focusing on training and webinars. And now he's at RIT. Uh, he's teaching and his life is just revolving around photography. He's a great presenter and I know you'll enjoy this presentation. So Dan, go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and let you take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate it. Welcome to the webinar, everyone. Uh, this is gonna be a really fun webinar. Uh, we're talking about Analog Effects Pro 3, or Analog Effects 3, rather. Uh, and we have some really interesting new developments in the software here. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, and I, I assume we have a wide swath of folks in the webinar today, so um, for folks who aren't really familiar with what analog effects is, is it, it basically brings the aesthetics of analog maladies into a controlled process, right? So it allows us uh, to have a, a very powerful, creative digital tool that allows us to put analog inspired effects and vintage inspired effects onto um, our, our images. So this is what we're talking about today in our webinar. Um, we're, we're going to take a look at the newly redesigned interface within analog effects, which is a, a huge update. Uh, we're going to talk about accessing your, your favorite styles and presets. And we'll get into the U-Point technology because there's um, a lot of new capabilities of the control point interface and tool set themselves uh, that, that will enable you to control your images in a different way and maybe think about utilizing analog effects in a different way. And that's, that's actually one of the major beauties of this update is that it enables you to find the tools in my mind in an easier way um, and then still have access to all of the sort of pre-built cameras and presets uh, that, that have been built into previous iterations of the software. Uh, now, I'm gonna jump right into our first image here, and I just have some different example images. Uh, well, it's one image, but some example sort of uh, presets, and these are actually just single click presets that I've placed on this image of, of uh, Joe Maddy, who's a fine artist uh, photographer. You can see him standing next to uh, one of his Wizard View cameras. Uh, made right here in Rochester, New York, uh, way back in the day. Now, uh, you know, what this software primarily does is it allows us to control what would be considered sort of problems in an analog realm, but control them in our digital realm so that we can decide, you know, how much lens distortion might actually create an effective image here. or um, you know, what kind of vignetting or funky color effects might do some interesting stuff, again, sort of emulating a lot of the different um, analog processes that might might be, uh, that, that you could do, depending upon how you might shoot the image. Uh, what we're gonna do is access the Nick plugins this time through the filter dropdown menu here in Photoshop. So I'm gonna go down to the Nick collection dropdown and go over to Analog Effects Pro 3, and we're gonna launch into this new interface uh, there we go. All right. So uh, the major update for the software is this new uh, contemporized interface that matches or is very similar to in, in terms of the usability to the most recent versions of the Viveza and Silver Effects. And now, of course, Color Effects having an update as well. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really important facet, especially for analog, because the previous version's interface was very different than the rest of the suite. So now, um, as we start to move around the software, if you've used Viveza, if you've used Silver Effects, you're, you're going to uh, be able to switch into analog effects very, very quickly and easily and use it for its creative processes. Uh, now, in this case, what we're going to do is actually start uh, the sort of interface walkthrough on the left side. So I'm gonna move over to the right-hand side here. There's a little triangle, and I'm gonna just click on it. That's gonna hide the tools palette on the right. 
our image is going to get a little bit more uh, sort of inter uh, interface uh, real estate. And uh, follow me over to the left side of the interface where we have our presets called cameras here with an analog effects. Now, each of these different groupings, classic camera over here, double exposure, motion, sample recipes, toy camera, and so on, uh, these are different combinations of the tools that are built within analog effects. So we're gonna take a look at these tools in a little bit, but basically each one of these different groupings has uh, their own set of presets built in, right? And so here, this is classic camera number five. By the way, I'm gonna clear this in just a second because we're gonna be clicking on a lot of presets. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, anytime you click on a preset, this prompt is gonna pop up and it just says adding a preset is gonna replace whatever tools you've used um, you know, previous to clicking on the preset. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and click do not show again because we're gonna click on so many of these presets, we don't need to see this popping up every single time. Then I'll click the yes button because we know what it says and uh, we're able to move into our different uh, presets really quickly, our different cameras. Uh, one of the other major updates, and I don't know, um, you know, after I've watched a whole bunch of videos as um, the, the newest version of the software has launched, not, not that many people are talking about how much snappier the interface actually is. It, it works much quicker. You know, if I click on En Vogue here, and then I go into analog, or I'm sorry, another black and white, it takes it a second for the image to load, but it's much faster than the previous version. So long story short, your cameras here on the left-hand side are, are all built in, ready to go. Uh, you, If you're familiar with the previous version, you'll be familiar with a lot of these. Um, and they're very easy to click on and use. It's just, it looks a little bit different, right? Another uh, interesting facet built into analog effects here is the recently used option. If you click on that, it'll actually give you a list of the, the most recent presets that you've clicked on, which is really a nice way of working as well. If you like to work with the same kinds of um, uh, looks over and over again. And as I tend to do, I, I use uh, similar tool sets and similar filters quite often. Um, and another facet that, that you might be familiar with already, but is now integrated into analog effects is the ability to favorite one of these presets. So if you click on the little star that's to the left of the label here, this is going to um, go into your favorites cameras and it's also going to show up in your Nick Selective tool if you're launching the software from Photoshop using the Nick Selective tool. So it's a nice little option. You just click on that little star, it highlights it, you're ready to go. Uh, now, uh, on the left side, you've got your custom presets. So these are any presets that you would have created yourself. You've got your imported presets. So if you um, have, let's say two computers and you make a preset on one of your computers and you save it, you can export it and then you can load it up on your other computer and it's gonna show up on imported. Or if you've got friends and you're sharing um, you know, analog effects recipes or presets, they can save them out and, and you can download them and or get them via email and so on and import them directly into your analog effects now, which is a really nice option. So um, the last thing that we're gonna click on with this image for now is the history state browser. So if you follow me into the lower left corner here, and we click on the history, uh, what we're seeing here is the recorded history of everything that we've done to this image while we've been here within Analog Effects Pro. So this is a nice option. Um, if, you know, let's say we actually moved over to the tools palette on the right, and I just start, you know, maybe fidgeting around a little bit, I'll blur um, the, the side of the image. Let's say we add a little bit more detail extraction. You know, maybe let's increase the saturation. You can see all of those things reflected in the image, of course, but then you can also see that reflected in the history browser over on the left-hand side. And so if you decide that you, you know, kind of want to move back in your process, you can say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to go back to um, the last preset that I clicked on, and um, that's going to bring us back in through our process. It just makes it an easy way to visualize what's happening. And then um, we can move around and we can even compare the image with these, uh, the different history states that are built in. Now, I'm going to click on Autochrome. So we're going to step back one more. I'm going to go ahead and just move into the lower right corner here and click the Apply button. And we're going to move into another image. 
So we've talked about our presets, we've talked about the cameras themselves on the left side of the interface, and um, now we've clicked the apply button. This brings us back over into our uh, Photoshop interface for now, and our image is applied, or our adjustments from analog is, is gonna be applied. And of course, here in Photoshop, um, we're working with layers of pixels in this case, and therefore you have your original layer and then a copy of your original pixels with your process uh, applied to it. All right, so let's move into another, actually let's go to this photo. So um, this is the sort of obligatory portrait. My friend Kevin made this of me sitting on his, I'm, I'm trying to look as tough as possible sitting on his, uh, his scooter here. It's like a 1994 scooter. Um, nice light though. And what I like about analog effects is it takes these digital, you know, uh, well exposed, the color's practically perfect in terms of color temperature, in terms of color rendering, it's really quite nice. Um, and we can breathe new life into these images use, utilizing analog effects. I'm gonna access the software again from this drop down menu and then when we get into the last couple images, I wanna talk to you about the Nick Selective tool. For now though, I'll just click on Analog Effects Pro. And uh, we're gonna click on a preset. And then I just wanna augment the preset, right? So in that cameras section on the left hand side, the thing that we basically focused on the entire time on the last image, uh, we have some really beautiful and, and really interesting ways of, of creatively adjusting our image. Uh, I'm gonna move into classic camera. And I'm gonna click on, I think it's classic camera number five. I kind of like the effect of this. It mutes the colors a little bit. It's just a, it's a very different style now, right? So, in, and it's relatively subtle. If we take a look at the before and after uh, by moving into the top portion of our interface here, I can press, press and hold the compare button. You can see the original image and then the enhanced image. Um, the classic camera, this one in particular is a relatively subtle adjustment. Uh, it is a preset, of course, and, and what that means is you click on it, it applies the thing to your image, and then if you want to be, you can just be done, or if you want to, you can move over into your tools palette on the right-hand side, and you can go in and manipulate these different tools. So um, this classic camera is going to be applying the basic adjustments filter, the dirt and scratches filter, uh, the lens vignette very subtly, the, in the film type, and what I wanna do is actually add in another one of these uh, tools, right? So this is our tools palette on the right side. Of course, our, uh, our presets, our cameras are over here on the left side. But if you follow me into the upper left corner, we also have a camera kit. And this camera kit is the listing of each of the individual filters that's built into analog effects. Right, so a lot of uh, analog effects users like to start with these cameras and then move into either the tools palette on the right and start manipulating those filters, um, or move into the camera kit and add or subtract the different filters that you want on the image. So um, as I'm over here on the left-hand side, uh, let's say we don't want the lens vignette on the image. Well, all we have to do is scroll over lens vignette, the filter itself on the left side, and then click this little minus button. And you'll see a couple things happen. First of all, I'll click the minus button. You'll see the image slightly change because I'll be removing that vignette. And then you'll see the filter that's over on the right side just disappear, right? So I'll go ahead and click that minus button and then it disappears there. There's actually another way of, of removing those filters. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, oops, I, I removed the film type, didn't I? I wanted to remove my lens vignette. Um, and I wanted to add my light leaks. So I'm gonna scroll up a little bit, click on this little plus button, and that's going to add in a light leak. Of course, it, it applies it to the image right off the bat. Uh, the other thing that I wanna point out to you is that any filter that you're using for on, on the image at the time is going to be highlighted with this little gold bar here. Right, so that's in indicating to us that that filter is on, um, and that's a really nice thing, so you don't have to scroll through all of the different filters, especially if you're using, you know, more than four. Let's say you're using six or eight of the different uh, filters from the camera kit. 
it's nice to be able to just really quickly say, okay, well, you know what, lens distortion isn't working for this image, get rid of it, or whatever, um, to augment that. So we've clicked on light leaks on the left side. I'm gonna move over to the right-hand side, and this is where you're going to find the controls for the filter itself. So I'm gonna click into this drop-down menu, which is gonna enable us to switch the sort of stylistic light leak that we're going to be applying to the image. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead, I think I'm gonna try this dynamic. I had one in mind. I'm gonna go into dynamic and we're just gonna click away. And uh, I'm gonna click on this one, kind of like what's happening there. Uh, but notice how snappy this is. My my computer is a, a five-year-old, right, four-year-old uh, MacBook Pro. It's, it's no slouch, it's a good computer, um, but it's an older computer um, compared to what's out there. And yet, you know, as I click on the different tools, that it, the interface is much snappier. It's much faster as I click on these things. So I've clicked on um, a different one of the light leaks. I can, of course, affect the strength utilizing the sliders on the uh, in, in the particular filter. And in this case, I'm just sort of turning this up. It, in my mind, just to kind of explain what I'm doing photographically, um, if I turn off light leaks, and we sort of sit back here, you know, the image, it looks fine, it looks good, but I like the the added layer that occurs when we're using this light leak. You know, not only are you going to see kind of the direct effect of the light leak happening here, but it's also going to adjust, um, you know, kind of the overall contrast of the image. As we turn this light leak filter on and off, you can see what's happening. I'm sort of losing a little bit of my D-max, that is the, the detail and the, the darkest tone within the blacks, the darkest values in the image. Um, and it, it just creates this other kind of life to the photo in my mind. Now, I don't want the light leak to be applied um, on the entire image in this case, because I, I like what's happening overall as I toggle this on and off, but I am, my skin tone is changing, and then the trees in the background are also sort of being affected um, in a way that I don't find to be nice. So what we're gonna do is go into our control points, and we're gonna be able to remove the filter effect or put in the filter effect where, wherever we want it to be. So I've scrolled down in our light leaks filter. I've clicked on the control point button and I'm just gonna go ahead and drop a control point right in the middle of my head in this case. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about these control points um, over the next sort of 20 minutes or so. But for now, what I wanna do is just size the area of influence. So I'm gonna size my area that I'm gonna be affecting. And then we're gonna go into the texture strength and I'm just gonna go ahead and remove it from my skin tone, right? Uh, now, if you're wondering where the filter is being applied and where it's not, in, in this case, the filter is being applied everywhere except where we've taken this control point and removed the texture. If you ever wanna see the, uh, you know, the effect of the control point, um, a lot of folks are gonna be very comfortable with this portion of the interface uh, because it's reflected in all of the other rest of the, the NIC tools. But if we go to control point number one, first of all, I'm gonna double click on it. And I'm gonna just put on, I'm just gonna retype it and say, name it as my face. Um, and then I'm gonna go into that list and I'm gonna click on this little box. So there's a little box that has a circle in it and that's going to um, allow us to see the selection that this control point is making. Um, notice if I expand the area of influence, I'm going to be affecting some of the other areas. In this case, I kind of just want it to uh, be affecting my face. Um, and so of course we can manipulate the effect of the control point using the area of influence. So that's the, the area of the circle that's uh, going around um, the control point itself. Uh, and then the other thing that we can do, and this is a major update, is we can actually control uh, what's called the color selectivity. And that is we, we can hone in the selection of the control point or we can make it very broad if we, if we feel that that's going to be what's useful. Uh, so in the, in, I'm gonna show you this over and over again, by the way, uh, but let's zoom in. So I'm gonna hit the command plus button on my keyboard a couple of times. You can see the selection that it's making of my face. Uh, looks kind of ridiculous right now, but uh, the selection is nice. My pose is sort of just a uh, silly pose. But anyways, my color selectivity, if I 
take this luminance slider and I start to bring it to the right, what it's doing is it's making um, a more sort of pulled back selection. It's gonna get more precise. It's gonna be more um, looking for the luminance value, that is the brightness value of wherever we've placed that control point, right? So the luminance slider here, slide it to the right, it's going to get more concise, more precise. If we dra drag it to the left, it's going to broaden out, right? And so you can see the selection changing. Um, now, the other facet that, that you really wanna pay attention to, because these are exceedingly powerful tools, these control points are a really lovely way of working and create this very photographic looking selection. Um, you know, one of the other ways of honing the selection, got the area of influence, of course, you've got your luminance and your chrominance slider, I'm gonna continue to talk about those, but you also have just the exact place you place the control point, right? If I put the control point right here directly on my forehead, I'm gonna get a slightly different selection than if I put it on the bridge of my nose, right? And of course I can put it on the bridge of my nose and then just sort of broaden out my selection a little bit, but, but by working with these facets, the area of influence, size of it, that is, the place where you actually put the control point, and then your luminance and chrominance sliders here, um, that's really what's gonna be able to dial in the exact kind of selection and then the exact kind of application of the area that you're putting your filter in or you're not putting your different filters in. It opens up this, this enormous amount of creative capability. So I'm gonna zoom back out. We're gonna continue to talk about control points, but for now, um, I wanna just make sure that I'm not putting the filter in up here and I'm not putting it in down there. I'm gonna say we're good to go. Let's take a look at the before and after because this set of effects that we're putting on the image is a little bit more subtle uh, than the previous image where we really transformed the photo. You know, here we have, uh, you know, a relatively flat, the lighting is nice, but a relatively flat kind of rendering on the left side, the original image. And then on the right, uh, we have a little bit more of a lively effect. And I, I think the other thing that works well is the fact that I'm sitting on this, this uh, scooter from 1994 or so, uh, which is gonna sort of help with this analog kind of aesthetic too, in this case. Anyways, long story short, uh, I went and clicked on the side-by-side -side preview. It actually started out as a, a on, you know, on the top and on the bottom. But uh, as I click the twirler in the middle, you've got the left image, which is the original, and then the our enhanced image on the right-hand side. So let's click the apply button. Brings us back over into our Photoshop. It applies the adjustment for us. All right, so here we are back in or back in Photoshop and we've got our analog effects pro applied let's close this image we don't need to save it in this case and then uh, we'll move into our uh we'll move into our watkins glen image so i think on this photograph we'll we'll do a similar process to what we just did we're, we're going to go ahead and um, go into the filter drop down menu go to the nick collection click on analog effects pro our analog is going to launch for us and you know what, let's, let's go into our cameras. So onto the left-hand side of the interface here. We're already in the recently used. Um, and so what the reason I wanted to, to sort of work this way is that the classic camera number three is the recipe or the preset that we used, the camera that we used on that last image. Um, and so th this is a nice way of being able to see what we did last time and speed up any kind of workflow. Now, there's there's a lot of ways to automate workflows, and there's a lot of ways to kind of just simply speed up systems. Um, and this interface change is a really nice way of being able to do that because you know these are the most recently used um, presets that are here on the, the left hand side. Now, of course, any of my favorited presets are going to show up um, over here on the left. Uh, which apparently I don't have any favorited recipes or presets, although I should because I clicked on a couple of those stars. So I'm just gonna click on a couple of these stars that are to the left of those labels, click on favorite again, and you can see those showing up. Those are all classic camera. All right, now in this case, 
we're going to go into the wet plate. We're going to we're going to sort of create this. Uh, oops, I need to turn my favorites off. Uh, we're going to go into the wet plate cameras and let's just click on them. So as I click on wet plate number one, it's going to be reflected into the, in the filters on the right hand side and on our image in the preview here. Uh, if I just use my up or down arrow, it'll actually update um, the the preset over here on the left side as well. Oh, I kind of like that green of wet plate two. So um, this is an image of Watkins Glen for anyone who's not familiar. It's one of the sort of uh, New York State attractions, New York State Park. Um, it's a it's right outside of, of Ithaca, New York. It's a really beautiful area. And this is one of the sort of obligatory landscape images uh, to shoot. And in this case, I, I shot it with a 30 second exposure to kind of create something slightly different. You can see the people who are in the image are actually just blurs. So um, because of the 30 second exposure. Uh, but what I want to do with analog is, is make this into something different than what someone's going to see in any other situation looking at this exact same image that everybody shoots when they go to uh, Watkins Glen, which is fine. You know, we can we can go to these places, we can all shoot the same kinds of images, and we're going to get different outcomes. The beauty of analog is we get a very different outcome or a slightly different outcome if that's if that's what we're going for. So I clicked on wet plate number two. I'm gonna go ahead and just hide the left side. So clicking on the little triangle to the left over there, it just cleans up our interface a little bit so it's easy to see what's going on here. And let's let's move over to the right-hand side of the interface because we started to use it on the last couple images, but we didn't really explain uh, the different facets here of the interface. So uh, first things first, moving over to the right-hand side here, let's go ahead and just jump into the loop. Right, so this loop tool follows your cursor around the image and it, it is showing you what your image looks like in that particular area, so wherever your cursor is, is over. Um, and it's showing you a before and an after, so your split preview there. So it's a nice way of being able to see what it looked like originally compared to what it looks like now, right? Now, if you ever want to pin, or that is lock in your, your loop in a particular place, you can just click on the little pin that's in the upper right corner here, or actually right here. Um, oop, I'm gonna click the pin, there we go. And then I go to the area of interest that I wanna lock in place here, and I just click and it locks it in place, hopefully. That should be working for me. Your loop tool follows your cursor around, shows you what it look, the image looks like zoomed into 100%. Uh, your histogram is a live histogram. It has uh, the sort of indicators of shadow and highlight indicators for you. We don't have anything that's completely black without detail or anything that's completely white without detail. So you're not seeing those indicators show up. But then you also have uh, an RGB readout and then your individual color channels as well as your luminosity. So these things are going to kind of ring true throughout the contemporary version of the Nix suite. You're gonna see this same histogram um, built into those different tools, but I figured we should maybe talk about it. Moving into the basic adjustments tools, right? So um, talking about each individual filter here, you're able to turn on the uh, basic adjustments or the filter by just clicking on this little checkbox. So this is a great way of being able to see like what each individual filter is doing to the image. And oftentimes, just so that I can get a good idea as to what's happening on the image and what filter is really affecting and doing the thing to the image, I'll go in and I'll just check all of these check boxes off and then go back in and rebuild it, check them back on. And if there's anything egregious or anything that I can see isn't sort of fitting the aesthetic, the look that I want, um, I'll just go and turn those things off, right? In fact, film type, we're gonna use a film type, but, um, you know, in this case, as I toggle the film type on and off, you can see we're going from a neutral black and white image with a really dark black, a little, really dark D-max, um, to this film type when I check it on. Now the image has this sort of green color cast, maybe a little bit cyan, uh, and the D-max isn't nearly as dark, the darkest value, so we have less contrast. It looks a little bit more faded. 
So that it's just a nice way of being able to see what each filter is doing. Now, back into the basic adjustments section here. Um, if you move over to the right-hand side, we have updated capabilities with control points. So we're actually able to reset control points, or sorry, reset filters, as well as copy and paste control points from one filter to another filter that utilizes control points. And so for folks who are familiar with color effects, this is, is the is a same, it's kind of like a holdover. It's a, it, this is brand new within Analog Effects Pro. It's a really, really wonderful update to kind of and contemporize the interface and make things sort of flow between each of the different NIC tools. Um, and it's easy to get to, right? So each one of the filters is gonna have that little pop up and pop down, at least any of the filters where um, those control points are going to be applicable like that. Um, now, if you don't want to have one of these particular filters, you just click on the little X um, that's to the right and that will get rid of that particular filter. And then if you just want to hide the filter, you hide it in terms of the actual sliders, you can click on the uh, carrot that's on the right hand side and you can hide the filter from the interface, right? So uh, just to make sure that I'm good and clear here, the checkbox on the left is going to toggle the effect on and off, right? Whereas um, the uh, carrot here on the right is what's going to sort of hide or show the view here. So uh, let's keep moving. I like what's happening overall. I actually kind of like the, this image with the color back in it. So I'm going to bring my basic adjustments and um, bring my saturation back up. And then the bokeh is doing the, the sort of bulk of the movement here or, or the, the manipulation of the image. So uh, Many of these filters have the on image control. So you're able to kind of control where, in this case, the filter in the blur is being applied. Uh, so this is going to be emulating our sort of circular blurring bokeh filter, uh, which is a nice way of being able to kind of direct the viewer's attention through the image. And just to explain it a little bit more thoroughly, the center of the image or the center of this portion of the interface uh, is going to be tax sharp or as sharp as your image is in capture. Uh, then as we move from our, our first uh, circle here out to the second or oval in this case, uh, you, we have a gradient, right? So if the center is without blur, the edge here has very little blur and the further out we go from the middle, the more of the application of the blur we're gonna get. Right, so by the time we get outside of that second oval in this case, uh, we're gonna be getting the full application of the blur. Of course, we can control how much blur we get utilizing the slider on the right-hand side. We, we aren't going to get enough time today to talk about every single slider within the software, but just know that many of the filters have, or several of the filters have an on-image facet, that is the on-image control here, and then, um, all of them are going to have some kind of slider effect, right? You're gonna be able to control the amount, or in this case, the bokeh, the actual blur strength and the shape and so on um, uh, that, the, that the application of the blur is getting. So uh, anytime I add blur, I also tend to like to add some grain as well. Uh, it helps to kind of match the blurred effect to the non-blurred effect. And in this case, to do that, we're gonna go into our film types. And I'm just gonna go ahead and reduce the fade. So I'm gonna bring my fade down, in this case to uh, 50%. And then I'm gonna bring my strength down to zero, right? And what this is gonna do is just turn off the uh, film kind of effects that we're getting here. And then that allows me to go into my grains and um, add in some grain overall. So I'll just add maybe 298 grain per pixel. Uh, now, it's really wonderful to have this grain engine built into uh, Analog Effects Pro. It works really nicely. It's beautiful for our film type here. Uh, I'm gonna click the apply. Actually, I'm not gonna click the apply. I'm gonna show you the split preview before we do that. Um, but I will just point out in the newest version of ColorFX 5, uh, there's a new grain engine that's built into the software that has 
um, gobs more capability. So this is a really beautiful grain engine that's in here. For most, it's probably what, what we wanna use a lot of the time because it's in this one piece of software. But if you do want a little bit more control, try out the Color Effects 5 uh, film grain effect that's built in there. So going into our split preview, uh, on the left-hand side, we see the original. On the right-hand side, we see our enhanced. And of course, we can click on this and slide it back and forth. And this is another a uh, really nice way of being able to see exactly what's happening to the image and where, and you can sort of track through the photograph and say, okay, you know what, maybe my my blur is encroaching too far into the image. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll go back up into the bokeh filter and I will change the shape of it so that I'm not encroaching so far into the image and maybe reduce it. Anyways, we can sort of futz around in here forever and we're not gonna do that right now. I'm gonna click the apply button and then we're gonna jump into our last image. So um, I wanna talk more about control points because there's some, some other capabilities that are built in and I wanna talk more about the sensitivity adjustments. Uh, there's a lot that you can get out of um, uh, the way that the selection is being made with control points. This next image, it this sort of reflects something more similar to what I would do in my own process. And that is, um, I like to combine the different Nick plugins together to get different kinds of effects. So if we look at the original kind of composite image here, this is a, a photo um, from Crockett, which is a small area, small town or a region that's right outside of San Francisco. Um, and uh, we were right near a sugar mill, which is a really fun place to make photographs. Uh, but anyways, I'm utilizing Color Effects Pro 5 and then Analog Effects Pro. And I wanna show you the Analog Effects facet here. So I'm gonna delete that layer. And uh, this time we're gonna use the Nick Selective tool. And I just wanna point out a couple of little differences. So with the newest version of Analog Effects Pro, if you click on the little carrot that's on the right-hand side, um, you're gonna, be, have access to your last edit, and then you'll also have access to any of your favorited uh, cameras or presets that you've generated yourself as well. So this is just a, a nice way of being able to launch directly into one of your presets or one of your favorite applications of the tool. So as that launches, we're gonna do a sort of custom build. So instead of utilizing the um, filters from this particular camera preset, we're gonna move into the camera kit, and we're just gonna kind of build from scratch. Uh, and I have a, an idea of the tools that I wanna use in this case. Um, and we're gonna start with the basic adjustments. And what I wanna do here is just sort of zero this stuff out for the most part, at least to start with. And uh, this is gonna allow me to be able to really see what's happening on the image. So uh, with the it, it, this is just a different way of working, by the way. A lot of times it's best to start with a preset, but uh, for anyone who is somewhat familiar with the software and wanting to kind of take it to the next level, and you, if you've never tried to work this way, try this, where you get rid of the different filters that, that the software is applying based upon the camera, and then just kind of work your way down the filter list. So starting with basic adjustments up at the top, here I've um, removed all the detail extractor. I've um, added a little bit of brightness. I'm gonna remove my contrast to kind of fade the image. And then I'm gonna increase some saturation, right? And I can take it too far. And that can be a really interesting application, especially if we're gonna go in and maybe add uh, dirt and scratches and then photo plates and so on. But um, in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say less is more and we're gonna go a little bit more subtle. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanna do is kind of get back a couple areas where I've got some nice shadow tones. So we're gonna add a control point to do that. So within the basic adjustments, when you click the add control point button and you go and place a control point, your control point is gonna make a selection when you drop it on that area or object. Um, and then you have the ability to selectively adjust the same facets that you could with the global adjustments. So um, mind you, I placed the control point right here on the image. The um, global adjustment sliders are at the very top, but now as we sort of roll our eyes down into our control point selection adjustments, 
uh, we're able to go in and actually uh, specifically control different parts utilizing these different tools. So in this case, I'm just doing a little bit of um, you know dodging and burning. And of course, we've got tools like very powerful tools like Viveza and the control points built in there. This is kind of like, at least in my mind, a light version where you've got brightness, contrast, and saturation. So um, I made kind of some, not necessarily egregious, but uh, you know, some dramatic global adjustments. And here I'm just able to kind of dial everything in exactly how I want them to be. By the way, I'm duplicating these control points. And the way that I'm doing this is I'm holding the option key down on my Mac, be Alt if you're on a PC. And while you're holding the option key down, you just click on the control point you want to duplicate uh, and drag. So it's option or alt, click and drag. And so what we're doing here is I'm just getting some of these, these darker values back into the image um, overall, even though I kind of brightened up the overall uh, global image itself. All right, so I like what's happening here with my basic adjustments, right? There's the before. There's the after. Let's move into dirt and scratches. No, we're gonna add um, bokeh. So let's add that. And then of course the default bokeh is going to be a circular um, area here. Of course we can change that over to a sort of uh, tilt shift emulation. And this is where what I wanna do is just blur the foreground and then the background out a little bit. Um, so, let me adjust that. And I want to keep my middle ground basically blur free. So I think that will work. Um, we can increase or decrease the blur, of course. That's way too much. I just want a subtle little blur. There we go. Keep it simple. Um, dirt and scratches. So, uh, the control points that are built into dirt and scratches are more like the control points that are built into color effects right so i'm gonna if we were to talk you know the, sorry let me rephrase this the the basic adjustment control points allow us to control the brightness contrast and saturation right because that is the set of tools that you have built into that basic adjustments filter um the dirt and scratches capability Let's say I go and add one of these dirt and scratches onto the image, right? And this is this is too much in my mind for this image, uh, but this is gonna allow us to then, um, it's, it's too much in this case because the strength is all the way up at 100. But the other thing that we can do is go into our control points and add points into the areas where we don't want them to be, right? So I place the point in the area where I don't want the dust, I take my texture strength and I start to reduce that, right? And now, this is where having those uh, color selectivity adjustments um, and it's chrominance and luminance, so it's color and luminosity, as well as the size of my control point, um, as well as the exact placement of my control point becomes important, right? So let's say we wanted to get rid of that stuff and then we go in and we make this a little less broad. So now I've gotten rid of that, you know, big hunk of dust that was right there. And we can we can duplicate these control points and start moving them around. And of course we can control exactly how much dust we want. I don't think I want any of this particular filter um, dust. So I'm gonna get rid of those control points. We're gonna move back over into the filter on the right side and I'm gonna go into the organic dust and scratches. And I'm gonna just add one of these other capabilities because um, I like what's happening with a lot of them. Of course, I, I have the filter on 100% strength. We don't need to have it on 100% strength. And in fact, most of the time, maybe we don't want it on 100% strength because it can become a little bit overwhelming. But the, the beauty of dirt and scratches and the beauty of photo plate or light leaks, in this case, is we're able to control you know, where the filter is being applied by moving it around, because this is sort of like an overlay of dirt and scratches, right? Um, we can control how much by utilizing the strength. And then of course we can we can decide how much by utilizing control points as well. So I, I know 
that there are folks that are in this webinar saying, why on earth would I want to add dirt and scratches to my image? Well, the, the interesting facet here is it adds this other layer of sort of materiality, right? So in, instead of the image not instead of the image being flat, and I don't mean flat in the sense of contrast, but flat in the sense of um, you know being without layers necessarily, using something like dirt and scratches, using something like light leaks or photo plate adds this extra layer of depth to the image. And then being able to control exactly where that depth is and how much there is in those different areas is why this is such a powerful thing. You know, like if, if I wanted to, let's just remove it from some different areas. In this case, I like the, the application of dirt and scratches kind of on everything, but let's say you had a portrait and you wanted dirt and scratches on most of the image, but you wanted it reduced on somebody's face. You just drop your control point on the subject's face and take this texture strength down to whatever percentage works well, you know, whatever is going to um, look good for what you're trying to do. Now, um, I know I'm coming up on time, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the luminance and chrominance sliders within the color selectivity. So what I've done is I've gone into control point number 17, uh, which is this point right here. You can see it's highlighted in, in that sort of orange gold tone color. Um, and of course, if you change the size of the area, we're gonna be broadening out the selection in terms of uh, what it's what it's looking at in terms of tones and colors because we're adjusting the size of the area. If you drag the control point around, you will instantly see the selection that's being made, of course. And then if you move into your color selectivity sliders, let's talk about chrominance in this case. So luminance is looking at the brightness level, right? So how bright or dark. Chrominance is looking at the color value of the thing that you've placed the control point on. Taking that slider to the right is going to um, hone in that selection. So it's saying, okay, we're only going to work on these particular greens, right? Because that section is green um, on the side of that little um, breakwater, which I think used to support a dock or something. But um, the, the chrominance here, if we slide it to the left, it's going to broaden out our selection. Now, um, in some situations, a more broad selection is going to be more useful. And then another you know, the sort of 50-50, the default is where you're going to want to be because the control point makes a great selection most of the time. Um, now, if you slide both luminance and chrominance all the way over to zero, now we have a gradient, right? It's a circular gradient, which this is a whole other way of working. So you're not worrying about how the control point is making its selection. You're kind of just placing the point where you want it to be sizing the area of influence, and you've got this whole other way of working, right? And being as precise or imprecise as you want to be. All right, I'm gonna click the apply button here. I actually wanted to add uh, one of the, the film types and frames on this image, but it's 4.54, we're coming up on time and I wanna save at least enough time for some questions. So, um, Lori, let's go ahead and transition into our Q&A. Okay, uh, Susan and Alice were both asking about the the filters, uh, the light leaks, can mm -hmm. the angle be changed or the effect moved around on the image? Great question, yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't think the angle, I don't think it can be spun, but I know that you can, um, let me go into my uh, recently used, I want my last adjustments. Yes, yeah, so hang on just a moment, I gotta get back to zero here. Uh, Let's go in and add our light leaks. That was the specific one. So the different, some of the different filters have some different capabilities. So dirt and scratches and light leaks has this on image control, which allows you to move the light leak around, uh, but you're not able to, you know, let's say rotate um, or change the size of it. Uh, you you can move it around. So it's it's a nice way of just shifting that filter. Um, you can move these light leaks around and then you can change the strength of it. And then of course you can use control points to remove the effect from different areas. That's that's about the extent of that control. Uh, dirt and scratches, same kind of thing. You can control the amount of it. 
and then you can move the dirt and scratches around. So if we apply this one, start to shift it. Um, whereas if we go to photo plate and we add photo plate, the photo plate is an overlay on top of the whole thing. You can't move it around. What you can do is just control the strength of it and then decide which one you want and then decide you know, how much of that effect you want um, utilizing control points as well. Okay, Dan, how about uh, Robert is asking, are final edits destructive? That's a really good question as well. So um, the workflow that you choose will determine how much sort of, if you will, destructive processing there is, right? So in this case, the entire webinar, I've been applying um, these adjustments to a layer of pixels. Right, which means this is not the most non-destructive process that I could be working in. So the way that I'm working here, I do have layers. I can turn them on, I can turn them off. We can save this as a PSD file and so on. But basically this application is, is set in stone, it's done. If rather than working the way that I have here in this stack of layers, if we were to convert these into a smart object, we would be working in a you know fully non-destructive process. In fact, if we had launched our raw file from Adobe Camera Raw into Photoshop as a smart object, we would be able to go all the way back to the Adobe Camera Raw settings as well. Um, so the the workflows kind of change the sort of destructiveness that you have. Uh, one thing that I do want to add that is if, if you're launching from Lightroom or you're you're launching from um, you know uh, yeah, Lightroom or yeah, Lightroom or Photo Lab. Geez, it was escaped me. Uh, you can work in a non-destructive TIFF-based process that way as well, because there's a checkbox that's built into the software uh, that allows you to go back in and reprocess the image. So in this case, I'll just turn on my smart object. Maybe we'll click on a preset. Um, it's, so this is saying that we are identifying that this is a smart object. And so the brush is deactivated, but you have the ability to work in this non-destructive workflow. So let's say I click on expired film. It applies that. I click the apply button. You know, everything we're doing now is, is going to be re-editable so we can go back afterwards. Cool. I'll open this back up, but Lori, I think I can take an, one more question. Yep, we got one more. Uh, Pamela is asking, what are the major differences between Analog Effects and Color Effects Pro, and why would she use one over the other? Right. Yep. Good question. So um, there is quite a bit of crossover in terms of Color Effects Pro Five and Analog Effects Pro, um, but they have very different filter sets, and the interfaces kind of look similar now. But Analog Effects is sort of explicitly designed to give you sort of more vintage kinds of feels, if that is a way to you know total up this software. Um, whereas Color Effects Pro is a collection of 55 filters, some of which are meant more for um, uh, corrective adjustments, sort of fixing problems that might be occurring within exposures. Um, and then some of those filters within Color Effects are, are creative filters as well, and then it is a different menagerie, a different grouping of tools uh, built into Color Effects Pro. And the analog is just sort of explicitly these filters, and then you have these kinds of effects, which are very different than the kinds of effects that you have, for the most part, built into Color Effects Pro. Like multi lens, we didn't click on multi lens, but this is an interesting tool. Um, this breaks the image into uh, three different zones in this case although you can actually adjust how many, right? So you can create the kind of these, these one-off different versions. You can expand them or collapse them and make them smaller. You know, this does not exist within color effects. Uh, the double exposure filter as well. So I'm gonna get rid of multi-lens. The double exposure basically allows you to um, overlay another exposure image right on top of your original photograph. So this is a really great creative capability. What it does by default is it applies a double exposure of the same image. But if you move into the double exposure filter on the right side and you click on this little plus button, you can actually open up JPEGs and TIFF files um, 
let me just go and find one. All right, so let's say we're going to use this one, which is not a, a great example, but you can see it's a very different photograph. Or if we uh, click that X and click another one, we can basically go in and decide what images we want uh, double exposed or um, multiple exposure on top of it. So I'm just going to find one more image that maybe is a little bit more applicable. And um, yeah, let's overlay a picture of me on top of this other picture, right? Because base and and the, and so this is a whole other kind of capability, and this is not anything um, that's even cl remotely close to uh, what's built into color effects. Yeah, because I mess with the balance. All right, Lori, any more? Uh, that should do it. Cool. Okay. Hopefully that yeah. was a helpful explanation. Yeah. Very creative software. You can just go crazy with this. There's so much in it. Uh, we could probably go for two hours. <laughs> oh, easily. Or more. Yeah, 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 easily. Okay. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. Dan, thank you so much for this presentation. And um, yeah, we're really excited to present uh, this updated Analog Effects Pro 3. As you can see, the new interface and other new things that Dan has shown you today. So hopefully, if you don't have it, uh, you go ahead and get it and, um, and enjoy it. So Dan, thank you so much. And we wish you guys all a very good day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.